grab a biscuit because this tea is too hot to drink all at once. Skincare tea, that is. We're going to be talking about popular skincare trends in 2025 that are nothing but a smoke and mirror show to separate you from your almighty dollar. Coming in hot at number one is PDRN. You can't get away from it. It's everywhere. Open up an app, turn around, boom, there it is. This is a bottle of salmon sperm and it's literally the strongest one on the market. This is Regurin. This is the number one salmon sperm on the market and it's so cool. It has a vial. You pull this up and it gives you the perfect dose of the salmon sperm. How unique. And you just place your finger here, push down, and it'll eject it, ejaculate it, whatever you want to say. This is a thicker, rich serum. It feels insanely good on the skin. I've been using salmon sperm daily, and it feels like I got a facelift, so I won't be stopping anytime soon. How pretty that makes the skin. Not to be confused with P-O-R-N. I know the D and the O, they can look a little similar. And some of you guys are like, Dr. Dre, wh what What are we doing here? What What kind of territory are you getting into? Not not the not the freaky deaky stuff, okay? Uh, polydeoxyribonucleotide is what we're talking about. Small fragments of DNA. They're thought to act as adenosine A2A receptor agonist. Okay, great. What does that mean? Well, they may play a role in modulating tissue repair, wound healing, improving levels of cyclic AMP to improve cellular metabolism, recovery, and they may even stimulate the almighty fibroblast to produce that coveted liquid gold collagen. The promise of PDRN, however, is largely amidst a landscape of preclinical studies. Cells in a dish, small animal models, there is a serious, serious dearth of literature on PDRN, let alone applying it to the skin, for human use. The main compelling line of research that we have is injecting PDRN to diabetic wounds to get them to heal faster, which is amazing. Like that is a really cool thing that we should keep studying because we're not even there yet for diabetic wounds, but that doesn't stop skincare companies from being like, oh, we have a PDRN serum, a cream. It's going to rejuvenate your face. It's going to bind only to the things that you want it to bind to. It's going to elicit the pathways that you're only desiring, and it's going to ignore all of the background biological pathways, just stimulate fibroblast not going to stimulate anything negative oh no no it wouldn't do that we're guessing why are we guessing because we don't have the research behind these now a lot of the pdrn hype stems from these facials that people are getting where they are injecting pdrn derived from salmon sperm salmon dna i mean that's that in and of itself is something that captures attention on the internet oh my god i'm putting animal sperm in my face the pdrn to porn pipeline you can see how they get confused that by itself is not even something that is well studied, let alone FDA approved to be doing here in the US. But then you've got the landscape of topicals. Really not much out there, if anything, on applying PDRN topically to the skin. It's like, how in the heck is that supposed to remain stable, get into the cells, and again, bind exactly where we want it to, do only what we want it to by putting it on our face in a cream. I'm just not buying it. I did a review on PDRN and I talked about the VT PDRN serum and how as a moisturizer. I thought it was great, but I was skeptical about the PDRN. Now, you'll recall from that video, if you bothered to watch it, or maybe you were confused and thought it was some sort of adult film getting ready to launch, the marketing draw on that was that it was a vegan PDRN, meaning uh, coming from Panax Ginseng. And I did point out in that video that, yeah, you know, there is actually a preclinical study, at least, showing that PDRN isolated from Panax Ginseng can go about doing some of the same things in vitro, okay, preclinical, not on humans that the the salmon stuff does so i was kind of like all right all right all right but y'all the other day i was thinking about that video i was thinking about the product um because i'm making my way through it and like i said it's a, it's a decent moisturizer and i thought to myself you know panax ginseng extract panax ginseng and then it dawned on me oh wait back the bus up panax ginseng extract and andrea you have been reviewing skincare products for years now and how many times has panax ginseng extract come up multiple multiple times in multiple products I have reviewed over the years one of my favorite retinaldehyde serums for eye wrinkles from beauty of Joseon has panax ginseng extract in it I would say the PDRN hype here in the US at least has gotten amped up mm, tail into 2024 maybe 2025 maybe in some corners of the internet even earlier but that was a what 2021 2020 type product and I know I know there are others out there with panax ginseng extract pre PDRN hype. There were products out there with Panax ginseng extract in it. 
no mention of small DNA compounds that could modulate wound healing. And here we are 2025, PDRN is the thing to talk about. So it dawned on me, it's like, wait a minute, are they taking the exact same Panax ginseng extract that many of us have used for years now in different products, and now they're overlaying the PDRN claim just for marketing? That, that is exactly what they're doing. That's exactly what they're doing. You mean to tell me we have Panax ginseng extract that has been in skincare products for a while now, and you want me to believe that somehow you've done some special testing on it to establish that it's got PDRN in it? I don't think so. I think it's the same exact Panax ginseng extract we've been using in products for years. It now just has a new marketing spin to it to fit into a Google search. That's what I think. Smoke and mirror show number two is exosomes. Holy grail product for glowy, glassy, healthy skin. This master esthetician, I just turned 38 years old and I am obsessed with exosomes, specifically the ones from the brand Radiant XO. I have tried so many and quality matters. I am on my second bottle and truly have never gotten more compliments, the best skin of my life. First off, let's talk about exosomes and what they are. These are little vesicles of proteins, uh, nucleotides, that cells release, other cells take up, either engulf or the vesicle binds to special receptors. These little vesicles, like PDRN, modulate a variety of biological processes. Cool exciting. Huge avenue for biomedical application. Wound healing, hair restoration, repairing photo damage. But as far as putting it on your skin in a cream, it's like, whoa, 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 wait, wait a hot minute. Is it actually stable? Is it actually getting in? Where did you get these? What exactly is it doing? Is it going to work in every person who uses it? Does it need to work in all of these groups? Are some people not going to benefit from it, whereas others will? Well, some people just have adverse effects. These are questions we don't have answers for because like PDRN, there is a dearth of clinical research on exosomes. I did find a compelling study in the realm of exosomes applied topically in anti-aging where the researchers actually isolated exosomes from a bacteria that is normally present on our skin as part of our skin microbiome. And the study was interesting because it showed that in 20 something year old people, they had more of that bacteria in their microbiome. And then with age, that amount of bacteria declined. And so what they did is they took the bacteria from the 20-somethings, they isolated exosomes from that bacteria, and then they applied it topically to 50-year-old women. They showed that in comparison to placebo, there was an improvement in moisture content, there was a uh, decrease in wrinkles, there was improvement in skin elasticity, and there was an improvement in uh, pigmentation, like age spots, and an improvement in dermal density. But when you actually look at the clinical data that they present, the graphs and things of that sort, it's honestly not that compelling. Like it's, not, we're not talking about a really robust study with a lot of people. You really have to question, are the exosomes actually stable in skincare products and getting in? There's no established protocol for isolating them, sourcing them. It doesn't stop skincare brands from putting them in things. And I think it is largely smoke and mirrors at this point, which is unfortunate. You know, they take something that is really interesting scientifically and for which we have some preclinical evidence that it's compelling, a compelling avenue to pursue, and they jump the gun. All right, the number three trend, and that is the trend of claiming that various and sundry holistic approaches like taping your face up or eating certain foods or putting arnica on your face is nature's Botox. I mean, you will find influencers on TikTok, especially on Instagram as well, claiming up and down all around town that they have nature's Botox. It's it's just so annoying because sure, certain things may help improve moisture content in the skin and diminish the appearance of wrinkles just by better hydration, but that's not how Botox works. Botox works at the level of the neuromuscular junction to inhibit facial muscle contraction. You're not going to paralyze these facial groups doing all of these nature's Botox interventions that people claim, you know, work. For example, Arnica. Arnica is not well studied to do anything, actually. Some people claim it's helpful for reducing swelling, reducing bruising. The jury's still out on that. A lot of people claim that it's nature's Botox and it, it's not getting into the skin to act at the neuromuscular junction to prohibit muscle contraction. Neither are topical skincare ingredients like argireline, a peptide that claims to be Botox in a bottle. It's not getting down there and actually doing that. I mean, can you imagine how haphazard, harmful that could be if people just put it willy-nilly? I mean, because Botox needs to be 
injected in specific places to target specific muscle groups. You don't just put it all over, you know, smear it all over your face and then, you know, hope that it paralyzes strategically. Uh, that'd be weird. Let's not pretend that moisturizing or improving water content or any of these things is the same thing as getting a neuromodulator <laughs> to reduce dynamic wrinkles. They just don't work the same. Speaking of the face taping thing, the other trend, oh my gosh, this, this is hazardous to your health. It's this morning shed nonsense. I reacted to a video a while ago, but it keeps popping up on social media. And basically these gals are going to bed with all of this tape on their face, on their head, on their neck. I mean, it is like, I, I don't believe it for a second that people are sleeping like this. So they have a bonnet with their hair up and you know, sleeping in a silk bonnet, I've done it myself or a satin bonnet. It does help cut down on breakage fragility. I mean, that is some a tale as old as time. People have been doing that forever. It definitely can help cut down on breakage and fragility, but they've got all of this tape on their face, like the, the mouth tape, which is a whole other tale of, of smoke and mirrors that taping your mouth shut improves breathing. It doesn't. And it can be harmful to tape your mouth at night because it can disrupt proper breathing. If you have some sort of nasal blockage and you're not able to take good air in through, I mean, all sorts of problems. Silicone tapes, they do help mitigate the appearance of wrinkles by improving water content in the skin. But this is just way, way too much. And they have a variety of serums and products. I mean, it is ridiculous. And it gets to a point where there's no way people are, are sleeping that way. And all of that occlusion, it, it can be too much of a good thing. You can end up getting miliaria, a type of heat rash due to occlusion of the sweat glands. I think this trend is all for social media. I don't think people are actually going to bed with all of these contraptions on their face. I love using those types of patches like to the forehead or around the eyes and even to my neck. And I've slept comfortably with one or two patches on, but this whole taping your mouth shut, your eye mat, I mean, it's like, wow. I can't imagine waking up in the middle of the night. I would have a full on night terror with all that. It'd feel like that scene in The Never Ending Story with the horse going down in the quicksand. Yeah, that's how I would feel. I would not, I would not get down with that. All right, and then the last trend that you really need to be careful of, it's the ultimate smoke and mirrors these days. And it really, really, really grinds my gears. Sunscreen makeup setting sprays, sunscreen powders, not a problem to use for the benefits of depositing additional sunscreen on your skin. However, these do not put enough on the skin or a consistent layer on the skin to reliably get sunscreen. So you should never, ever, ever rely on those as your main sunscreen. And I think it's important to keep that in mind when you are choosing to buy, for example, a particular makeup setting spray. If you see a makeup setting spray that has SPF sunscreen in it, um, and it's a lot more expensive, but you think, oh, that'll be something good for me. You're probably not getting that much sunscreen from that product actually on your skin. And the price that you're paying, the d differential and the price that you're paying, it's probably not worth it. Better off investing in a sunscreen that you like for the base layer and a hat, those types of things, than spending the extra on the makeup setting spray that has sunscreen in it. The way people use a makeup setting spray, you're not getting very much actual sunscreen deposited on the skin at that point. If you go on the AAD website, for example, they tell you if you're going to use a sunscreen spray to the face, actually spray it in the hands and physically rub it into the face. And people hate to hear that because you're like, oh, no, 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 no. I, I, that's why I want the spray in the first place. But this approach of the, the mist, you're really not getting very much sunscreen actually on the face. Nowadays, I'm seeing brands come out with what a lot of people are just calling uh, face tints, but they're marketed as full on sunscreens. I mean, that's literally what they're calling them. They say broad spectrum SPF 45. And I tried one of these out from a makeup brand I actually really like. I tried one of these out in one of my vlogs. It looked horrible on my skin. And I saw a lot of comments from people being like, you're putting too much. And I was like, no, 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 buttercups. You're putting too little because that is one of the reasons, if you checked on my reasons for sunscreen failure, under applying is like the most common reason. People don't apply enough. And so I went on their Instagram page and I've seen this kind of thing a lot and it just really drives me crazy. And they, they were doing it. They showed this beautiful woman with very richly melanated skin applying their sunscreen in a shade complementary to her background skin tone at micro dosing amounts. Micro dosing the sunscreen. You're showing them how to use it incorrectly. I think it's incredibly misleading to pretend like they're not going to leave some degree of a, of a cast. Be careful of the smoke and mirrors show 
that is the mineral sunscreen, no white cast marketing towards people with melanin rich, deeper skin tones. Comment below though, are there any skincare trends that you guys are seeing right now that you want me to comment on, do a video on? Let me know in the comments. All right, y'all, I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends. And as always, don't forget sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.